Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Okay. Heavenly Father, we ask you to meet with us now in the power and presence of your spirit. May my response to these questions be glorifying to you, edifying to your son's body and upbuilding to your people. May it serve to advance your purposes and help and bless those who believe and convict and draw those who don't. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, Jacob, the question is from uh, one, of, one, of our, uh, uh, one of the believers is, was it unfair for God to allow Job to suffer over what was basically an argument between God and Satan? Let me answer that question <coughs> in the following context. There was a historical figure named Job. The story as recorded has historicity. It actually did happen. Most scholars looking at the Hebrew text of the book of Job reckon he may have been a contemporary of Abraham, somebody from the uh, patriarchal era. But what we have to remember about Job is at least two things. One, like all of the positive figures in the Old Testament, he's a type of Christ. He's someone who is suffering almost vicariously, uh, feeling rejected by God and accursed by God when the devil is going at him 110%. He's a type of Christ. The suffering of Job prefigures and foreshadows the suffering of Jesus. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is something which is in parallel to the experience of Job feeling abandoned by God. Where Job would say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Well, this is a picture of Jesus. Um, Jesus said the Father was doing this to him. Yet, it was Satan doing it to Jesus. They would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. But God still ultimately allowed it. So Jesus suffered for our sins. God allowed it. But Job is a figure of Christ. God allows Satan to have a go at him. Second thing we have to remember is Job is a picture of us. He's a corporate solidarity. He represents all believers. Man fell. We gave Satan dominion and power. Anything that happens to us, we're told in the book of Job, is something we have no right to complain about because of our sin. Any suffering, any difficulty that any of us has in this life or this world, even as believers, we have no right to complain about to God because of our sin. Job reached that conclusion. But we have to have the same conclusion. There is a battle between God and Satan, between life and death, between light and dark, between good and evil, and we are caught in the middle of it. Unfortunately, because of our fallen nature, we have yielded dominion to Satan. Jesus is taking us out of the dominion of Satan, back in the dominion of God. But Satan is fighting to get us back. <laughs> Let's go back to the fall of man. As there was a literal Job, there was a literal Adam and a literal Eve. They were literal people. But once again, they are figures. Eve is a figure of the church and by extension, I'm sorry, of Israel and by extension the church. But Adam is a figure of Christ before he fell. Adam was created directly by God, and although Jesus pre-existed, his body was created directly by God without procreative agency per se. Additionally, when Adam was created, he had no sin, just as when Jesus became incarnate, he had no sin. We're told that Jesus is the last Adam. So there's two generic men. We're either in Christ or we're in Adam. When we're born, we're in Adam. When we're born again, we're in Christ. Now, we bring this understanding into the book of Job. We are caught in a battle. 
although there was a literal Adam and a literal Job, Adam and Job, or Adam and Eve and Job, are pictures of us. In other words, if God had created you and your wife, or me and my wife, instead of Adam and Eve, we would have done the same thing they did. We would have committed the same sin. They're pictures of us. Okay, they get blamed for it all, but they they didn't do anything that anybody else wouldn't have done. Right. They're pictures of us. Okay, but Adam's also a type of Christ. Once God, uh, a type of Christ. And so Job is the same. He's a picture of us, but he's also a type of Christ. Now, when we understand that background, it is. Job answers the question for himself. Nobody has a right to complain about their fate or their plight in this world because of their sin. Not even a righteous man. Even the most righteous man has sinned. Even the most righteous of men waxes shallow there was only one truly righteous man who had no sin, and that was the Lord Jesus. All the rest of us, you, me, and Job, had sin. In that case, yes, Satan is the god of this world. He was doing these things. Now, God let Satan have a go at Job because Job is a type of Christ. God let Satan have a go at Jesus. But in the end... There's always a victory. Whenever God allows something bad to happen to his people who truly trust him, the end is always, in some way, going to be different than the beginning. The end will always end in a blessing. We read in the book of Job many, many things. And many people don't realize the book of Job speaks much in figure of the last days. But we read that the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. Then all his brothers and all his sisters and all who had known him before came to him, and they ate bread with him in his house, and they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversities that the Lord brought on him. Notice it was the devil who did it, but yet it was the Lord who did it. Same as Jesus in Isaiah 53. It was Satan who did it, but it was the will of the Lord to smite him. Satan is God's agent. Satan himself can only do what God allows. Although he is the enemy, something happens. It is the divine gambit. Even Satan's victories backfire on him and become his biggest defeats. What he did to Job seemed like a big victory, but it became a big defeat because Job prevailed, foreshadowing how Christ would prevail. So too, if they knew that God would raise him from the dead, Satan and the crucified the Lord of glory. In his death, Satan thought that Jesus won. In his resurrection, Satan's biggest victory became his biggest defeat, at least his penultimate defeat. His final defeat is coming. When God allows Satan to have a go at his people, he will always sustain them and never allow them to take more than he knows they can handle. His grace will always be sufficient. But we have to trust him that he knows what he's doing and he will bring good out of it in the end. Job answered the lady's question. He said, no man has a right to complain before the Lord because of their sin. Job realized that. Uh, Job says, what can I say? Will the Almighty contend? Or will the false find their contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I'm insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken, I will not answer. Even twice I will add nothing. Now what's interesting about the book of Job is, we are told that it was Satan who was doing this to him. Job was not told that. He may have understood it in retrospect, but the book of Job does not tell us that Job knew it was Satan doing it. He knew it was God doing it. In the life of a believer, when we go through serious trials, we may be under the attack of the enemy, but God is allowing it for a person, for a, for a purpose. But don't blame God. It's Satan doing it. 
Why does God allow it? God allows Satan to have a go at us, to set him up, to trap him, so it will all backfire and blow up in his face. The biggest victory Satan has always blow up in his face, just like with the crucifixion of Jesus, just like with Job. In the early church, it was the unspeakable persecution of the martyrs. But it was said by Tertullian, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The more Satan persecuted the church, the more it grew. Uh, just think of China. As far as anybody knew, there were never, ever, any more than one million believers in China from the time of Hudson Taylor to the time when Mao came to power. I've been to China multiple times. I've met with house church leaders in China. I shouldn't say that on television or on internet. The numbers of believers in China escalated dramatically under the persecution of Mao and the Cultural Revolution. God allowed this persecution. He allowed Satan to have a go with the church. Yeah, and what happened? It grew. Well, let's take this down to a personal level. It seems that God has abandoned you. It seems that the Lord is against you and all these bad things are happening to you. And Satan is having a field day with you. Why is God allowing it? Like Job, we may not understand it except in retrospect. But when it's over, when we look back, we will understand it. God will always bring good from the evil. A higher degree of blessing than there had been before these tumultuous events took place. Now, much can be said about the book of Joel, uh, Job. Understand the difference between affliction and suffering. Affliction is not ordinary suffering. Affliction is suffering when God allows it. We can suffer as a result of our own wrong choices, even as Christians. We can do things that are wrong, and there can be negative ramifications in our lives, and our ministries, and our families. That's not affliction. Affliction is where God allows Satan to somehow oppress us in order to set Satan up for a gambit, to spring a trap on him, and to bring us a greater blessing when we've prevailed under the trials, as James tells us. When you suffer affliction, there's not going to be any shortage of Job's friends. Remember Job's friends kept coming to him and saying, this is happening to you because you're not spiritual. This is happening to you because you sin. This is," <laughs> And they began preaching at him and trying to straighten him out and setting themselves up as having it all together and, and, and being solid when in fact he was far more spiritual than they were. They couldn't handle what he was going through. They kept telling him things. Well, if you go through affliction, the same thing's going to happen to you. They're going to tell you things as if they're looking down on you. In chapter 13 of Job, verse 2, Job says, What you know, I also know. I'm not inferior to you. When you're going through affliction, people will say, Brother, you just have to trust the Lord and have faith. Hallelujah. You shouldn't give place to these negative thoughts. You should claim the victory. You can trust Jesus. They're going to give you a religious pep talk. Uh, when you're in affliction, you don't want to hear that. You need to hear the voice of Jesus, not the voice of a man. And Jesus isn't really talking, but he's there. What you know, I know. I'm not inferior to you. Pay attention. There is no believer, no believer who God really uses who has not gone through a season of affliction where it seems that God has removed his protection from you, that he's removed his sense of presence with you and he's allowing Satan to have a full-blown attack against you. You'll feel alone and isolated. Other believers, even people in your family and among your friends are going to be preaching at you, 
thinking there's something wrong with you spiritually and that they are somehow spiritually superior to you when in fact they just don't understand. Well, the Lord has not abandoned you. He's right there with you the whole time. The sense of his presence may be removed, but his presence is not removed. There's nothing going to happen to you that he can't handle and he cannot equip you to handle, no matter how bad it becomes. This is affliction. There is nobody who God uses in ministry. Nobody, no pastor, no evangelist, nobody who God really uses who has not gone through a period of affliction in their life. Job is a picture of us, a type of Christ, but a picture of us. When it happens and it's over, there'll be a victory. That believer who's gone through the affliction and persevered by the grace of God will come to a higher status and stature than they had before that. But also, Satan will have sprung the trap on himself. He must be a very frustrated enemy when even his victories turn into his defeats. And the bigger his victories, the bigger the defeats that come from them. He must be very frustrated when even his victories become defeats. Well, that's the way it is. That's what happened with Jesus. That's what happened with Job. And that's what happens in our lives. Understand, affliction is a particular kind of suffering that God allows in the life of a believer. It is very lonely. It is very frustrating. Other believers will, by and large, not be able to understand it. People who are carnal Christians cannot even relate to it, and they think there's something wrong with you, that your faith is floundering, or it happened because God's judging you. for something. They just don't get it, and they can't get it. There's no point in trying to explain it to them. When it's over, however, you will understand, and Satan will be left on his tuchus with egg all over his face. Guaranteed, every time. I hope that explains the question, why God allows this. Thank you, Jacob. Jacob.